Hey, I'm Morgan here with Arna, and thanks for listening to this Future Skills Academy production. Today on Creative Leaders Unplugged, we talk with David Kester, a managing director at DKA. Yeah. And what's the other title? Yeah, he also uh, is the uh, managing director of oh, yeah. the uh, yeah. Design Thinkers, design Thinkers Academy, Academy London. London. Yes. And uh, I'm having to memorize this because we actually didn't even talk about it in the podcast. No. So. No, we did not. No, we did not. <laughs> which that's is, okay. Uh, that is quite okay because there were a lot of other uh, beautiful things that we talked about. So many, yeah. And I, yeah, yeah. I, again, I, you know, I've known David for a long time. He's also been very inspirational, I, and he's such a great storyteller. And you mm-hmm. can, you he know, really uh, is. Yeah. So I don't know. But what was your takeaway? There were two. I mean, he's so he he started off with like explaining where he grew up. And that just instantly, you know, was making me think of where I grew up. And it also, Mm -hmm. you know, when someone explains where they're living to you, you try to put the pieces together and build a a visual in your head. So I have I have a visual in my head. And so that's sticking very strongly with me. But then in the end, he also like comes around and talks about organizational design and like the intention behind it. And how sometimes organizations just there's one organization that was very intentional with how they structured things and set things up and. Yeah. I think that's kind of what stuck out with to me. And then, of course, like how he brings it all back together, like you very astutely noticed, sadly, podcast, and list, podcast listeners can't see it, but his face really lit up when he talked about the other amazing people in his life. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, think uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, those are like the three main things, like having this really strong, he's a great storyteller, so you have this strong imagery in your mind, and then like about yeah. organizations, and then about the importance of other people. Yeah, that's the. I think that's my my takeaway from from all of this. It's well, it's also the, sort of the the power of storytelling. So being able to tell a story, and you go like, why why is he a good storyteller? What makes him a good storyteller? Because it, it, it's, mm. it's it's you know he has a great voice, he has a presence, but he he knows how to structure the story, and it's sort of you know you can you know you visualize it. <laughs> you know I see him yeah. as a kid, and I see him that you know where he grew up, and then sort of that's the that's a sort of such a powerful thing because it it, it takes you along with him in mm-hmm. his, on his journey, and so. And the other thing is people, uh, like you said, amazing people. But he's always, you know, he always knows somehow to connect to people that he then somehow, you know, you know that help him or he, he helps them. But these are amazing people, and I know some of them, and they they are amazing people, and and some of them are quite known, well known, mm-hmm. and they are amazing people. So people, you know, community people, ensemble, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the being the. Yeah, sort of the, the engine that is kind of, you know, running and it's purring and it's like doing its thing and it's when the team is working really well and it's like you know that this that that that, that kind of, yeah. So I think that's my takeaway because it because it made me think about how I create my kind of communities. Mm, and, and, yeah. Uh, right. So because I because when you hear you go like oh, yeah, I you know that's really what you kind of have to kind of make happen. And then it's going to work, and otherwise it just doesn't. If it if it's not if you know if people don't want to be together, if they don't like spending time together, if it's not this what he said, you know, it's a great dinner party basically. You know, yeah. it's great to be together and people enjoy each other. But there's diversity too. Sure. Uh, yeah, I You're think gonna... that's a. So he he mentioned at one point this quote from Winston Churchill, something along the lines of, "If you design the surroundings." The surroundings will design the, the yeah, people. You first start with the buildings, with the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where you start. You start with that. So, which to me was a great metaphor also for for organization. If you design, yeah. if you design an organization for people to feel powerless and you know and and have no no ownership and and and, and feel that they are you know, in a safe space, then that's going to happen. That's you designed your organization. Because you know, accordingly, that's that's why it's happening. So if you you so if you want to have an organization with a specific culture, specific behavior, specific specific outcome output, then you have to think about how you you know you think have to think about the architecture. You know that's sort of you know exactly. The architecture. 
Exactly. And as I'm, as I'm also looking at this and, you know, he's had, he's had a, you know, an amazing, amazing career so far, and he does a lot of really cool things. Hmm. And also he's been able to surround himself with incredible people. And that's kind of designing your surrounding in a way, right? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. I moved to a new city. I didn't know people. So I got plugged in with this local group. You know, he was yeah. being intentional yeah. kind of about how he's designing that surrounding. And exactly. I think that's something a lot of people should be a bit more mindful um yeah. yeah yeah design your own surrounding be with the people that give you that give energy. you that positive energy and mm-hmm. uh yeah mm-hmm. exactly. yeah. Cool. yeah so well let's let's listen to the interview i might talk about being a parent i might talk about being a londoner i might talk about my background and so yeah yeah we're all so many different things rolled into one yeah yeah, being a, so it's kind of because I've never thought of you as a Londoner. I don't know why, because you clearly are. What 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 is a Londoner? What is a Londoner? I feel like actually quite passionately, partly at the moment. I'm even running a project for the mayor of London. Hmm. But I see London as an amazing place where many cultures come together. I mean, it's a creative hub. It's a hub of many things, you know, technology and so forth. But I think above all, one of the things that I particularly love about London, and it is actually something important to me, is that when you walk along a London street, you will hear so many languages being spoken. You will meet and see so many people from different parts of the world, and they all come together. And it enriches what it means to live in London. And I think it makes what we do, particularly working in the creative industries and working in design so much better as well, because it means that we can design for so many different people, because as a city, we're made up of so many different people. But it's also one of the things that makes me feel comfortable, because in a curious way, I have an ambivalent relationship with the idea of being called English. but. I never have a problem with being called a Londoner, which is where I was born. You know, oh, that's I live. Nice, yeah. yeah. Have you always, I mean, of, of course you were born there. Have you always been a Londoner? Have you always lived in London? Uh, most of my life, but not all the time. And I've, I've worked abroad, but I've also, as so many people do, I have I went to college, and went lived in Bristol, uh, which is a lovely city, lived in Oxford for some time. I met my wife, Sophia, when I was at Bristol, and then she comes from Oxford. So we settled in Oxford for a while, and I would sometimes move between London and Oxford. But also I've done projects and so forth and lived short spot you know, periods abroad as well. But London is I mean, it's an amazing place and it keeps changing. It's changed so much in my life as well. So, yeah, I always feel very comfortable here. But I love different parts of the world. I've so enjoyed many, many times coming over to Amsterdam and Holland. I mean, you know, often to be with Arne and do things with him, but with others so as well. Nice. And when you when you moved away, because I didn't move... I guess I didn't move until also university, you know, you leave your kind of your hometown, you know, the neighborhood that you grew up in. And I moved and did moving away from London give you a different perspective on what it means to be a Londoner? Like, did it help? Well, probably. I mean, I feel like actually the weird thing about London, or I think the special thing is that if you move even around London. London is like lots and lots of different places. It's, you know, we we say London just like people will say New York or Paris or Amsterdam or Berlin or whatever. And of course, these places are actually, they're so big that they're made up of many, many microcosms. And I actually grew up in North London in a village called Highgate, which is actually on a hill. And it's and I grew up actually growing up in I grew up in a block of flats which was designed by a wonderful modernist architect called Bertold Lebeckin, who was sort of part of sort of Le Corbusier crew. Mm. And it was a very it, it was it's actually called High Point because it's the highest point in London. And uh-huh. we lived on the top 
four of that block. So we were literally the highest point in London. It was an amazing experience, and I can talk about that forever. But but the point that I was really trying to make is that living on that hill in Highgate is very different to say when we moved, when Soph and I, my wife, moved to London after we'd lived for a bit in Oxford and we lived in a with a really good friend of mine who's a filmmaker and he had a little sort of flatlet that we were able to rent underneath his flat it was like a studio flat on the king's road in chelsea it was amazing and and that was like a completely different experience like totally different and then we now live by the river in an area called putney and that's a completely different experience and it's very green and it's right you know it's got the river and it's got amazing green commons richmond park and wimbledon and i have have a dog and i one of the things i love to do every morning is get up and walk the dog and so those things but you know these are so many different dimensions of the same city and they're completely different and you slightly end up living in a bubble in that area and then occasionally you go into the center And it's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. (laughs) And I used to have this when I worked the design council, which used to be based, and for the 10 years that I worked there, was based in Covent Garden. And so every morning I would get up and I would take, I'd either cycle or take the train. And I'd go, if I took the train, I'd walk over Waterloo Bridge, which is... It's not the most beautiful bridge, but it's it's actually called the Ladies' Bridge because it was built by women during the war. Um, <laughs> oh. But it's also one of the most amazing visually because when you walk over it, you are at this sort of particular angle to the rest of London where you can, on the one hand, you see St Paul's and that amazing skyline. On the other side, you look and you see Westminster and Big Ben and and it's... It's just an amazing, amazing spot. And I would walk over that bridge and I would feel like, oh, I'm like a little sort of molecule or a some sort of little vessel in the veins of this incredible city that's alive. And you'd feel part of it. So I just think it's, you know, the, it's made up of so many different places and spaces you can find your space and place and then you can also be part of this incredible thing where mm. so many business and creativity and innovation is going on as well yeah it's interesting because I, I i in a way when i was listening to you i actually thought oh but then there's it's so big and there's so many people and how you might get really lost but actually you said no that you can actually there's so there's so much going on you can find your space so it's actually the opposite of what i thought actually because i was like oh where how do you find how can you not get completely overwhelmed and lost in such a huge place especially as a young person <clears throat> trying to find your way there's always a million other people do exactly like what you can do and better Right. But but what you're saying, actually, no, because there's there's all these little pockets that kind of are just right for you. You will find your space. Is that how you think that's part? It is. And I feel that firstly, I think communities and sort of urban design, which I've I I've enjoyed the little bits of time that I've spent working around urban design. And I I have done that for, for a little while. I led the commission for architecture and the built environment in the uk and got involved in some of the issues around that and i do think that great cities work in that way they enable sort of communities and to work to be communities in communities and you've got these sort of almost like concentric circles and overlapping circles and that's actually what makes them rich and exciting and i certainly felt that actually growing up it's something i was very lucky where in that block of flats I mentioned, we had mm. the most beautiful garden. It was like a sort of, I mean, in really, the, it was like a sort of, like in a block garden of flats. Of Eden. It was, it was very unusual because it was, <laughs> it was a social, so Bertolt de Beckin was an emigre, he sort of Jewish architect who, and he designed the block flats in the 30s and then another block went up in the 50s also designed by him on the same site and it was originally designed for a 
sort of printing company that made the sort of early versions of a photocopier called Gestetner. And the idea was that it was going to be a place where all their workers could live. Oh. And it would be like a sort of communal space for the for the workers, so like a sort of idealized place to live. And then when they completed it, they realized that it was all far, they'd, made, they'd spent far too much money on it and they couldn't afford to do that. And so they then actually sold them off as a block of flats. So, oh. <laughs> so it never actually achieved that ambition of being a sort of slightly socialist sort of ideal of living which i think would have been lovely but it also meant that the people who lived in it actually had this that we we all managed you know created a, this idea of a commune almost mm. and it had this beautiful big garden on lots of different levels different lawns and sort of play areas he, he's actually the architect who designed the penguin pool at london zoo same architect and it had these lovely sort of interesting spaces, a little bit like that. And we were like the little penguins in there as mm -hmm. children playing this space. But really, as uh, like I would have my skateboard and there were places that you could skateboard. And then you'd we I had in fact, a few of us had go karts, not not with motors, you know, just like ones like you handmade with the wheels of a pram that sort of thing but it was on a hill so we we'd whiz down and annoy all the other residents on our go carts and we'd make dens and climb trees and you know all that sort of stuff so it was really special and the school that I went to was I would get up in the morning as a kid and I'd have breakfast and oh, sorry, that's take because it's gone back a bit far. Yeah, yeah. Okay, get to the point. But I would no, go, go, no, 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 tell us. Tell I, us. I would, and I would set off through the garden, go down to there was like a sort of this lovely brick wall, but it was easy to climb over. And I'd climb over the wall, and there was a pool house, which an architect had actually converted into a home. And my friend Andrea lived there. So I would climb over the wall. Nearly always she'd be having breakfast with her family at that time. So I'd wave and she'd wave back. And then I'd get into the field and I'd walk across. There was like two fields as there were playing fields to the school through an orchard. And then I'd be at school. So it wasn't really like this. Is what I meant like London is not what you think it is always. And mm. in fact, if I carried on beyond the school, I'd have been on Hampstead Heath. So it was like this is like wonderful little island of green space so, um, I'm, so, I'm, yeah. I'm curious about the because the so it, the the block of flats wasn't designed for people who wouldn't i mean it was designed for the people working in that in that company or that industry yeah. and then it wasn't and then you sort of so families moved in people moved in but did the and it still turned into a communal kind of experience so is it the architecture the design that kind of led to that because that's interesting like or was it yeah i mean it must have been because it was designed in such a way that you kind of created that communal experience i mean i think that's so true and i think this relates very much to a sort of philosophy of design as well so i i think back to the design council which was actually set up during the war years in the middle of the Second World War, as part of an idea, a very visionary idea of the Churchill government to what, it, it, you know, assuming that they won the war, how would we rebuild our industry? How would we rebuild our urban infrastructure? And they came up with this idea of creating the Design Council. And Churchill actually said, sorry to your point on it, Churchill said, first, we design our buildings and then our buildings design us yeah and i think it's incredibly true you know mm -hmm. that i think we can't underestimate the huge impact that the physical and built environment has on our behavior it's why it's so incredibly important to simple things like having well-lit streets so that women feel that they can go out and exercise in the evening and that they don't feel that they need to be afraid. Exactly. You know, in, in so many different ways, the physical and built environment around us 
it shapes who we are, our ability to thrive. Yeah, it, it, it reminds me so much of, because I've been reading this book, Extended Mind. You know, this, I like the subtitles of Thinking Outside Your Brain. Yeah. I, any Paul, any Paul, I think. that So this idea that we kind of think of ourselves often, sort of you know, our brain is in this kind of, in this dark room in our skull, you know, kind of disconnected from everything. And this is where all the thinking takes place. And she says, no, it's actually not true. It's actually your brain gets all this input from all your senses. And it, and it basically just is a prediction machine. It's, it tries to predict what to do and how to survive in the environment. So your environment is your thinking. That's where you, what you're thinking is. So if you are in a, so, you know, in a, in a, a space, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, a block of flats, like it's been designed as a communal kind of block of flats and it, it will then do that. So this is exactly what she's saying, this idea of it, you know, but the people that you surround yourself with, are you in a dark, dark space or in a light space? Are you traveling? Are you not traveling? Are you, that shapes how you know your brain does that basically how your brain can predict things because it has all these scenarios but it's influenced by the outside world how what you touch what you smell what you see what you etc cetera, etc cetera. that's how you should and in a way so i mean it's not you know i think most people are like yeah duh you know of course but we don't but that's not how we organize things that's not how we design our environments usually so you know that's a really cool you know experience and in a way i'm thinking does that have any, did that have any impact on you that you still recognize? You go, because if you grow up that way, it must have some kind of impact on you as a person or as a, you know. I mean, hugely. I mean, one thing I realized very early in life was because I would, you know, I'd go around to other people, you, know, you make friends at school and then you go around to other people's houses and homes and then you, I would suddenly realize, oh, actually, everybody else is living in a completely different way to us. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which I, of course, when you're little, you don't, you, you're, you are the center of your world and everything is like you are. And then you gradually sort of place yourself on the map and you realize, oh, okay, I have to, I actually am interacting with the rest of the world. And that's one of the lovely things about design is trying, is that design is all about trying to see things through other people's eyes, isn't it? That's the very essence of what we try to do. But to your point, I was, I would go around to other people's homes and I'd realize, oh, they've got lovely homes. I mean, they were, you know, different homes and so forth, but they were really, really different because London is mostly made up of Victorian housing. Mm -hmm. So if you go to most people's homes, they were built, they're built in red, a lot of homes are built in red brick and they're from the Victorian era and sort of living in this sort of funny machine for living created by a, a modernist architect is very, very different and created a very different experience. But I definitely think that it influenced my, not just my outlook on life, but also a passion for design. I, I mean, I was influenced also by the fact that my mother was a designer. So I saw some of those influences firsthand. But but I actually only found my way to design very circuitously. And I definitely think that those very formative experiences almost, they, they form part of your DNA and they made me really realize how powerful it can be. Definitely. That's so funny because you, in a way, what you're saying is that both so the way you grow up in, you know, in a specific way, in a specific environment, that does something to you as a person. So me, what, which then leads to the way we design our urban environments produces a certain kind of person as well, in a way. I mean, obviously, not everyone's mother is a designer and et cetera, et cetera. But it does, you carry that with you, you know, where you grew up. And it's logical because if you grow up, I mean, there's this, you know, there's, you know if you grow up in the mountains, you know, you're a different kind of person than when you grow up in, in, you know, on the plains, you know, so, I mean, it's, so your location, your space, your place where you grow up, that does something when you're Dutch, you grow up, you know, <laughs> below sea level, it does something to your psyche, Morgan. And, you know, <laughs> so no, but it does. And, and so being very conscious of how you, you know, if you build urban environments, if you, you know, 
what well, it's such a responsibility really if you think about it but i don't think a lot of you know governments if you will are so much aware of that of that that it has such a long term effect on on people really mm-hmm. so yeah and i i'm, I'm so I'm also curious. Uh, so I'll just go back a little bit to because I, I still see you go to school and jump over that little uh, brick wall. And uh, where, 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 how are you, how are your school days? Were you did you like school? Or were you someone? How would like... they describe you as a kid? Like that's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think probably it would depend on what age. So. When I was that little kid that was climbing over that wall, I was, you know, probably more like nine or ten. And I think that people would have described me as very full of energy. And I used to giggle a lot in class and get told off for that because (laughs) things would just let me off. And I had, I remember having a very good close friend called George, who was Greek. And the two of us just always saw something funny and something that somebody had said. And then we would get the giggles. And But I was also very keen on what I did and the work. I enjoyed it. And then I think it's probably different from the teenage, the you know, the teenager later. And we all go through, I mean, I think most people go through an awkward phase, don't they, when they're a teenager? I hope so. I hope, I so. hope so. <laughs> I certainly did. And and I, and I think that I had, you know, I've painted a picture which could seem somewhat idyllic, but actually, I think mean, I had, my, both my parents, they worked. My mum as a designer, my dad had many different careers. I mean, I... I look very fondly at him. They both passed away a few years back, but they, my dad just did so many things in his life. And also he was a very good person. So there was a lot to look up to in both of them. But they were, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was born in the 60s, which means really I grew up as a child in the 70s. And my parents were sort of 60s parents with 50s values. I mean, what was interesting about them was that they both pursued careers and and enjoyed that, but actually they were somewhat stuck with 1950s values. So my mother would really feel that she had to sacrifice something of her creativity and herself as a designer to be there to have the meal on the table and and my father was I I mean I always remember when we sat around the dinner table my sister and I remember the I mean we funnily enough I I would there was there was a lot of conversation was about work which I think probably is how I understand or somehow almost ingested the idea of of business and entrepreneurialism because they they would talk about my mother was she was a designer but she set up her own design company and then she sold her design company and and my dad ended up on the board of a big company and uh, he did loads of things in his life and was very entrepreneurial and and also very creative he was a singer and he was on television and did all sorts of different things so they were t- they would they they didn't really understand children and so they would just talk about the things that were interesting to them and we would just sit there but of course you absorb all that stuff as a mm-hmm. child um, yeah Oh, I don't know where I got. I don't know wh- how we got to this point in the conversation. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I know. Hold on there. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know how would oh, people how, describe you as a child? Yeah. <laughs> well, how how would you describe me as a child was your point. And so I think that when I reached teenagedom, I sort of felt like I had to break free. That there was something, some there was something somewhat oppressive about those sort of nineteen, slightly what I would call nineteen fifties values, and were somewhat I don't know they were they were 
old fashioned. And what 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 just, are nineteen fifties nineteen fifties values? What, what what can you give me an example? Well, yeah, I, I tell you actually, I, it very much came to. There was a moment when all of it crystallized for me. A couple of things. One was my parents had a lot of books, and I think they were sneaky actually as well with their books. And what they would do is <laughs> they would put books on shelves so that my sister and I might find them and oh. open them and read them. But so we never realized that. So things like they never talked to us about sex education because that would have been like 50s parents didn't talk about this. My parents but they would put that. books. Yes. They would put books so that you would go and find the book and read the book. So that's I, how they would no. manage yeah, my parents did. It's uh, so annoying. That's so annoying. I knew my parents did that too, and I was like, mm, yeah. "Why? Why is this book, you know, here so would, on the table?" <laughs> but I, I'll give you another example because one day, my sister discovered a book, um, and she opened it and she called me over and she said, "I think you need to look at this book. We're in the book." Ooh. What? I was five years younger than her, so I didn't really understand what nurse she was talking about, because I think she was telling me this. She was about 12. I was about seven or eight. So I was like really trying to understand what she was talking about. But the book was written by two psychologists, and they'd done a study of dual career parents. And our family and my parents were in this book. <laughs> And the psych these psychologists had come and they'd observed us. We hadn't realized. I mean, and I was just like a tiny baby at the time. My sister would have been probably, you know, six or something. So she didn't remember either. But we were written up and we were called the Harrises in this book. <laughs> so we were anonymized. But actually, it was pictures? very obvious. Were there pictures of you or something? No, 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 no. Okay. But, but there were actual transcripts of what my parents said in interviews and it was very interesting because they would my father said this is what I mean by 1950s sort of outlook my father in the book says things like it's wonderful to have a son now and when he grows up he will be a lawyer or an accountant I know he'll do something and he'll and he will and and it's and but also I believe strongly that women can have a career and my daughter could be a secretary. <laughs> so yeah, I mean of course yeah. my sister read that and I'm very proud to say that she's had a fantastic fulfilling career, not and she didn't she did actually go to secretarial college to learn shorthand, but she did all sorts of wonderful things as in fact as a therapist and as a teacher and all sorts of wonderful careers that she's had. So didn't hold her back. But but it's but I think those were values of a time. Yeah. So I don't look and think ill of them for those ideas because they were well, the ideas here. Yeah, but it, at that time, actually, I think it's it was probably quite modern. I mean, you know, like my like my mother when she got married, or she, actually when she announced that she was going to get married, so she worked as a nurse. Her her boss kind of called her into the office and said, "So we're so sorry to see you go." And you're like, "What?" Because you're you're going to have children, and you know you can't be married and working. Because so she got fired basically because she got married. So in a way, saying, "Hey, I, I think." women can have a career in, in that context. It's actually quite modern in that sense. Now, you know, so yeah, you know, if you look back at things, you know, there's a lot of things where you go, whoa, we did yeah. what? We did, we said what? But it's so, in a way, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. you showed me a picture of your father once when he, he had this, he's a, you know, it's like a Fred Astaire kind of outfit Aww. with his hat and it's, you know, the cane and the, the suit and it's such a, you know, it's it's amazing. It's like very glamorous, very glamorous. So, really, really interesting parents. Very, very interesting people, and so something to look up to. But also, maybe you know, in a way, you know, it, it's it it again is the very unique personalities as well, strong personalities in that sense, right? Yeah, they were something to. I mean, there was there was also the fact that they're so both. I think. They both came from not troubled backgrounds, but they had struggle 
in mm-hmm. their life. And like many people, actually, of their era, because they were both born in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they lived through the war years. And, but they had their own stories that were really quite powerful. My mother was a kinder transport child, born in Germany and lived the whole Nazi experience. And my mother, uh, my, my father grew up in the East End of London, five brothers in a very small one bedroom flat with out sort of all of the mod cons. And both of them, their, their, my dad's parents, my grandparents on that side were refugees from the pogroms of Russia and Poland. And so, and so I think their context, I mean, they, they came through all of that. And then, of course, we were brought up as the next generation. And I mean, this is what happens, of course, with often with refugees, that that's like the next generation have it easy. So there was I growing up in this slightly idyllic, modernist flat. And of course, as you grow up, you suddenly realise that actually it wasn't like that for your parents. They didn't grow up like that. It also creates quite an expectation, you know. So and I, so, I, so I think, that, you know, you, you, it creates pressures as well. Yeah, well, I can imagine. So I, I think I felt that, which was probably also wrapped into why when you asked, what was I like as a child? I think there was the sort of child that didn't know those things and was just living in this lovely bubble, enjoying the bubble. Mm-hmm. And then the child that gradually became, became more alert to the world that they live in the world that everybody lives in, and also the world that that my parents had inhabited and the history and the context. And I think that then creates for, I think, us all at that age, that sort of, I I need to find out who I am in this. So yes, so I think my teenage years, like many of us, were that search for identity, I suppose, really. Mm. Yeah. And when... And you talked about some of the things that crystallized that realization and, of course, wanting to kind of escape that, maybe that bubble. Did you have, what was your big, did you have like one big escape or did you have many little things that you started to do? Uh Search for your... The the great escape. escape. (laughs) Most of that's totally now off record because (laughs) (laughs) Um... because there's too many people who might, not that I'm saying that's so many people are going to listen to that. I mean, of course they will. Podcast. It's your podcast. <laughs> what are you saying? Hello. <laughs> exactly. But, but yeah, but yeah, no, I did all the things that you can do when you're a teenager in London and, and they, and actually, I suppose what I would say is that I, I mean, my kids have been there too. I think they grow up and I think that's what kids do. So mm-hmm. it's good. And you want people to, you want your young people in a safe way to try Mm -hmm. things out and experiment and so Mm -hmm. forth. But, but I think we all, you know, people will, will rebel to a greater or lesser extent or find their rebellion at different times. And it's healthy because we all need to go through it. We need to find ourselves. So I don't think there was one, I don't think there was one eureka moment as such. I think it's a sort of a journey. I think, you know, that continued into university. I think really the time that I probably grew up most was just when I left college. And I think the moment that I had the opportunity to work and be sort of useful in the in a way, it sounds very utilitarian, but <laughs> that moment of doing yeah, yeah. things yeah, 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 I suddenly felt uh, I came alive. It's like, oh, this yeah. is what I'm here. To, this is this is what I do, and I love it. And I I never look back. And I think the everything up until that point was some sort of preparation for making myself useful. And I and I loved the fact that you could work in some way as a sort of creative professional mm. and be useful. 
follow what, the things. What was the what was the first job? Well, when I <laughs> I started actually, I, had, I, I suppose my you know I could sort of slightly divide my career, if you can call it that into chapters and the first chapter is definitely sort of like an exploration chapter where you just go and try lots of things but I started in the theatre when I'd been at college in Bristol I studied English and drama and then I became very interested in design and I started to design productions and work as a designer and studied around and did my dissertation around design and I suddenly realised actually this is the thing that was interesting. And after uni, I was part of a thing called the National Student Theatre Company. And we took a bunch of shows up to the Edinburgh Festival. And I was responsible uh, for cool. design. And so I had to make sure that nine shows got designed and built, which actually mostly meant very quickly with a few of us manically trying to build sets in a crazy way with no money. Yeah. But very quickly started to work in the fringe theatre. I became part of a little cooperative theatre and then I set up my own little touring theatre company and we got some grants from the Arts Council and set up some projects. And so very quickly, I mean, and we set up as a cooperative. So it was right from the beginning, I was sort of experimenting with also being a bit of an entrepreneur, sort of mm. trying things out, whilst also learning from the other people that I was working with. So yeah, I started there with the theatre. And then while I was working in the theatre, and living actually at the time, I then I was living in Oxford. <laughs> we actually, I can't believe it, but we actually lived in a garage. So that shows the shows probably how much income we were both making at the time. I I, I was with Sophia back then, because we, as, I, as I'd mentioned earlier, we'd met at uni, yeah. so we were living. Yeah. Your and second Greek friend. Exactly. Yeah, yeah the theme. Mediterranean <laughs> <laughs> uh, theme coming through. But yeah, the, I mean, that, that, that was, I, I was, you know, working in the theatre and I, I joined a local Friends of the Earth group. So it sounds very worthy, but it was a really <laughs> cool group. of people. And, and an email came through from the head office is, is saying that there was... Friends of the Earth yeah, sorry, back climate, is it a climate activism group? Is it just... Oh, yeah. Of Friends of the Earth is like, like, yeah, Friends of the Earth is like sort of Greenpeace. Ah, it's sort okay. of got member groups. It's an environmental pressure group. Okay. And and I thought it was really it was you know it was a great organization and and I and I'm partly just to also be a bit more engaged with life in Oxford because I didn't know people it was a way to be involved in the community so I joined it and this email came through to this local group it's just like like a, you know it's a local membership group yeah, yeah saying that the head office is organizing a rainforest festival. And that they want other people around, and there's lot, lots of local groups. Could people come up with some ideas and do some rainforest festivals up and down the country to raise money for Friends of the Earth? And I thought, what a cool thing to do. So I said, hey, Will, why don't we do the Oxford Rainforest Festival? So we all set to, and very soon we had a big festival on our hands with like a big comedy night, the theatre, Black Mime Theatre in a smaller theatre, all of the buses showing kids' artworks on rainforests, right. sponsored rainforest in the, the local park where people came dressed as rainforest trees, a concert for the rainforest, an exhibition for the rain. I mean, you know, it went on and on. And we raised <laughs> a lot of money. And it was great fun. I've not, you know, and the HQ and the phone for the Rainforest Festival was the garage where we were living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and it shows obviously that I wasn't working very hard at the time. I think I must have been a bit of an unemployed theatre person. But anyway, the upshot of it was that 
part of the way through this rainforest festival, we discovered that actually we were the rainforest festival. That that, <laughs> that email that had been put out by HQ, nobody else had taken it up, and in fact. HQ had had some ideas, but they'd never got on with it. So <laughs> we were the Rainforest Festival. That's so funny. <laughs> um, um, and, and so then the founder, well, the, the director of the Environmental Pressure Group, this is a very long way around telling the story, sorry. But anyway, he came to the opening of the festival and we met him and everybody loved it. And then he said, hey, do you want a job? Why don't you come mm. work for friends now? So that was my first proper job. That was a very long way of telling you that. Was no, it's time. awesome. That's a very good story because it, I mean, it first of all, it tells you something about you, but also it's, it's kind of also about the time that it's taken, it, you know, which is taking place because it's that time when there is no social media and there's no, but the, so you can actually somehow be sort of disconnected <laughs> that nowadays that would be like impossible because like, it, yeah. it will, you know, everybody will know and and it's so it's so kind of in a way it's almost like uh, oh yeah you could really do things in like a pocket and then <laughs> must have been so great to be you know in that headquarters office and that they started realizing that actually there's <laughs> it's actually happening well, somewhere <laughs> and they're like what, yeah, what? I, feel so for us. <laughs> I still somehow feel almost slightly guilty to this day although my colleagues who were members of that local group, because we were all volunteers just doing this. They, I mean, we all did it. It was like, that's, you know, I'm a massive believer in the idea of an ensemble. And, you know, in the end, that's how really great creativity happens. That's how great movies are made, how wonderful creative projects come into being, because people get together they work together they understand each other's strengths they play to their own strengths and what and and actually that little project was a just an example of that and I wasn't responsible for it you know we all worked on it together and then actually they offered me a job but actually it had, you know, I remember this most wonderful woman called Erica Eisen who was a member of that group who you know if it hadn't been for her it also wouldn't really wouldn't have happened but uh, you know, actually, they didn't want to go and work running creative projects for Friends of the Earth in London. And when I was offered that opportunity, it was like, oh, that sounds really fun. And so, yeah, I I leapt a bit. And this is when you moved back to London, right? So that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How, how, how long did you work there? About just over three years. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a sort of proper first job. Mm. And actually, I remember there was a moment, you you know, you were asking about where are those moments happen. And I, it was three years into the job. And I'd actually organized a festival at a very cool chapel called the Union Chapel in Islington. It was like a music event. And we had all sorts of things going on. And it was also happened to be then the night that my first child was born, oh. Joe. And and I remember it very vividly that evening. It was a very special evening. And of course, because I left everybody to be with Soph and we had our first child. But also it was a moment where in that moment I realized, okay, I have to leave because although I loved working for Friends of the Earth, I knew that we needed to earn more money <laughs> to, I had to find another way to support a family. So, so I was having great fun and I was really enjoying working for an environmental pressure group. And I'm sure today, if they heard this, they'd say, Hey, we pay our people really well because the world has changed, but, but this was then. So that's when I struck out and I, and it, one thing came to another sort of things just fell into place and I I ended it was very weird there was I ended up running an organization called DNAD design and art direction which represents the design and advertising industries particularly the creative side of that 
industry in the UK. And it runs, it's like an academy and it runs educational programs. It runs the big award scheme. It publishes. It's a, it's a really great institution. And it had run into real problems. And the guy who was trying to rescue it w- was an incredible man. He became a mentor to me. I He sadly died a few years back. His name's Anthony Simmons Gooding. And he was really, I always said that he was a captain of industry. And he would say, no, 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 I was a mere lieutenant. But that was just because he was very humble. And he wanted to turn around this. He was asked to help turn around this sort of institution in Britain that had actually got into trouble. And he decided he needed some young person who was foolish, who would throw themselves at it to help him do that. So he sort of found me and pulled me into this, into the this sort of crazy space. And I then had the most amazing 10 years there. It was incredible. And if I'm honest, from, you know, I'd studied design and I'd worked in design. I'd, design, I'd worked as a set designer. But I think the greatest education that I had was doing that job because I would spend every day with amazing designers and talking about design, learning about design, writing about design and creativity generally. And being in that mix for 10 years was an immersion in what creativity is all about. And that was an inspiration. And the people who work in that industry, they lift you up. That's what happened. So it was a real privilege. I I mean, it was extraordinary. But how did he find you? Yeah, I mean, I think you maybe undersold yourself that you're foolish. I mean, foolish, yes, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> but foolish and like what what about you made them choose you? Well, I just happened to be running a project at the time which was all about the relationship of design to industry and business. And I had set up some I just interesting sort of conversations. So I have to say it wasn't very profound, but they were interesting. So we would get, I I would bring people who were, say, working in the airline industry and British Airways and so forth. And I'd get them to meet the people who are working at the Royal Opera House to so that they could look at how the Royal Opera House can turn around the design of a production in a really short period of time. And so the idea was really learning from each other from these different areas of creativity and design and yeah and i'm that was through that that i met anthony and and he said you know i want somebody with that sort of spirit mm. here it was it was it was a chance meeting it he, I, and i was 28 and a, a very sort of naive and and keen and and eager to earn more to support my yeah, right. young family, and him saying, oh, "You could run this, do it." And I was like, "Yeah, I could do that." <laughs> and then of course, very quickly he realized, "Oh my god, this is difficult." But actually, he was amazing because he was there. He supported me, and he was an amazing coach and mentor. I learned an enormous amount from him. He he was there for that whole period of 10 years and beyond actually stayed a friend for life uh, that's nice. so yeah because i think it's really important especially when you are kind of thrown into such an experience that you kind of you need a mentor so it's actually really and you don't i mean i don't think a lot of people have had that you know that they didn't, didn't have the mentor they should have had you know they were just you know thrown into something like this and you know having that kind of person so important right I think it's actually, it it is underestimated. And, but it's one of the most powerful things that you can have. And it's a great thing. And and I mean, the whole idea of having a mentor, having an ally as well, Mm -hmm. somebody who supports you, it's something we can do for others. And it's definitely something. I mean, I'm, I'm, if you, you know, I suppose if I look at the things that I'm proudest of, 
Mm. Often it's looking at the people that have come through and thrived and done something special because they happen to have worked in your team and maybe because of some sort of support or help that you gave them that you, and it's not that you can pat yourself on the back it's just that you know, it's very satisfying yeah and and he very much did that for me and he would actually say to me i, mean, I remember actually there was a funny moment so we we had a board, you know, I was the chief executive and and we built and the team grew over the years and we thrived and it was a really lovely journey. And a few years in and every year we publish a book and it was called The Annual, the DNA D Annual. It's still published every year. You know, I remember the 50th anniversary for, an, annual, you know, it's been going many, many years now. And it's like a compendium of amazing creativity from that year. Mm. And every year we would give the privilege of designing the cover to a different great graphic or art director or whatever from the industry to design. And in this particular year, the, the president of the organization who had the privilege, he, that was one of the things that he could do or she could say, I'm going to ask this person to do it. And it, it Graham who became a lovely man, Graham Fink, wonderful art director. He had this, uh, he, he won't mind me saying this because he'll remember this story very vividly himself if you ever listened to this. He had this idea that it should, the book is often called the Bible in the industry. So let's actually make it into a Bible and we'll do it in the way that a Bible is. And it's got the, the, the embossed cross in it and it's got, gold and leather and the tassels and all of that and that's how we'll do it this year and one of my team Alex AD wonderful person who was the awards director was profoundly Christian and she was really offended by this and she said I can't live with that I can't live with that and in fact if we did this I would leave because I can't this is it's too offensive to me that you take the idea of Christianity in a Bible and then you fill it with advertising and design. And I and 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 uh, it's yeah. it's two ideas that don't work together and we shouldn't do it. And I think it's offensive, it's sacrilege. So I thought, well, actually, okay, I didn't feel so bad about it. I thought it was funny, but myself, but I felt actually, if this is going to offend somebody, and it's also if it's offending one of my team. We can't do it. Mm. So we had this board meeting and I said, Graham, we can't do this. He said, of course we can. And I said, no, you can't. In fact, we're not going to do it. And it became a bit of a, an argument. And then I said in the meeting, Graham, if you decide to do it and it is your prerogative, then I will resign. And he looked at me and said, well, I'm not going to. He laughed and he said, well, we're definitely not going to do that. And I'll, let's forget the book as the Bible, because, David, we don't want you to resign. So that was sort of the end of that. And we, like, we all moved on. And after the meeting, Anthony came over to me and he said, just let's just sit down and have a chat about what just happened in there. And it's like, well, I thought that went very well. He said, I think that went very badly. <laughs> he said, never, ever, ever threaten to resign unless you really mean it and in fact really if you're quite happy to leave and that's what having a mentor is also about and talk about it and let's work out a plan because there were other ways to resolve that rather than putting yourself on the line in such a way so which is of course what we do when we're young as well because we live in the mm. moment and we're hot and so forth and gradually we be hopefully become a little wiser and we don't act impetuously yeah. like that but yeah but having a mentor so, at so many other i mean it's it's i mean yes of course i mean this is a situation where you know someone needed to show you or tell you know to have a tough conversation with you for sure but i think if you know you you, you know this that if you know the, the clients we work with the, the companies we work with the, the people in the Often, you know, I think everyone can use a mentor 
or a companion, someone who has a honest conversation. Because I, I, in my experience, it's, it's really missing, and 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 people are not, are, you know, they're either too polite, or mm. they're too careful, or they don't feel safe, or they. But it really helps when someone every now and then says, "Listen, you know that it, it, that's that's not good. You know, should do that." And yeah, the the, the person that the person that can do that best, I think, is somebody who isn't actually sort of in charge of your day-to-day tasks. Mm. Yeah. So it went in 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 so many of people's jobs, they report into somebody, and that person who they report into, you know that person's most worried about whether they're going to get the job done. And what's really helpful is if you can work with somebody who isn't just chasing you you on your tasks, but actually sees the bigger picture. I've had that. I've been very lucky to have that because I also actually had that. So I I have to confess something because my, this is something that Soph says of me. She says the, you drag, I, I, I think she says it in a sort of nice way, but she says, <laughs> I, but she says that I drag people into my orbit. <laughs> that, like, if I want something to happen, then I will, really? you know, I'll take the project on, and then actually, these I sort of go, hey, can you help me? Can you help me? And people and people come in and they support me to do the project, which is crazy, really, isn't it? But, <laughs> but. I, I've been very lucky that as I worked, because I, I had a very similar experiences when I when I left DNAD and I I was invited by the then rector of the Royal College of Art, who happened to be the chairman of the design council. And he said, I think you should apply for this role. And then I got the job. And his amazing man called Sir Christopher Frayling. And then I ended up working for a succession of remarkable chairmen. And I found that I learned so much from each of them. I think it was partly that they were not concerned. They they trusted me to get on and do the job. So they were supporting me to be able to do the job. And that's what Anthony did. He would say to me, look, I'm here to argue for you, to support you, to give you advice if you ask for it. And I think that it's a hugely, fan- you know, it is underrated, Arne. I think if we can help people with mentorship and often also what they sometimes call, it's a bit of a, maybe it's a slightly woke word, I don't know, but allyship, which is this sort of idea that sometimes people need allies because they are, they may be out, they may be in some sense because of whether it's their ethnicity or background or something, they may feel that they're an outsider. And having an ally who supports them and looks out for them can be massively powerful. And it's often gives them the confidence and it's the difference between I suppose feeling like you've got to fight all of those battles yourself and knowing that there's somebody who's battling for you and it yeah. makes a big difference to confidence yeah. I, I somehow I, I see a parallel between you you know growing up in that communal space the way it's designed to really drives behavior and in a sense, organizations, you know, the way they're designed drives yeah. behaviors. So we don't design our, our organizations to create that kind of behavior or or have those positions because it's just not part of the design of, of, of the organization. It's not, that's not how it's structured. So people don't have that mentor. They don't have that ally. It's not even a word. That we'd use right it's not even it's not a so in a way you know it's, it's you know it's part of what we do obviously thinking about these things and trying to kind of find other ways to design how how we work and it's part of that so in a way you the, the building you know that was kind of this interesting metaphor in a way it's kind of very inspirational mm. you go like yeah but it's it's not just 
it, you have to build the building also first. And then, and then mm. well, that will also drive behavior. You can tell people to be, behave differently, but if the building mm. isn't yet there, you know, if they're not, if, if you want people to be, you know, create some kind of communal experience, but it's not designed that way, it's not going to work. So yeah. how, how do we, you know, how do we deal with that? Because I think a lot of people don't feel that they're in that safe space or they don't have someone. I think that's actually in many ways why I sort of found my way to the design work that I do now, which often is very strategic and it is around more what the proposition is, what the service is, and how you create that through culture, brand, structure, because I find that very interesting. And the I suppose the ideas and the people that I look to I that inspire me on that, they are the people who I think are really bringing some of the sort of best ideas of design into that organizational space. I'll give you an example. A designer that I think, you know, maybe they're going to be some creative folks, some designers listening to this podcast. Many of them will know the designer Dieter Rams one of the absolute greats of the sort of 1950s and 60s, still very much alive and kicking as an amazing industrial designer, and has set out some ideals on design, the his 10 sort of values of design, which I think are brilliant. But he also created an, an extraordinary shelving system called Vitsu, which today is still one of the best-selling and most brilliant pieces of engineering design as a shelving system. And one of the things that really fascinated me was that that idea, that little company, Vitsu, was it's one of the only things that Dieter Rams ever designed independently of you know his wider industry career, and. It was bought by an entrepreneur and a great design lover called Mark Adams. And Mark built a business based on the principles of Dieter Rams. So he built these ideas of what great design is into the culture of the business, into the HR processes of the business, even into the manufacturing plant, which is a really amazing net zero, sustainable building, into everything, the way that you can buy the product and the way that it arrives with you and the way that you're supported. It's in every fiber of the business are the values of DC Rams. And I find that really interesting. And I also see that in other companies like the amazing company Freitag, who make those lovely bags. I once gave you one, Arne. Yeah, as a, as my a, favorite one. If, yes, uh, <laughs> companies that have explored new ways of working, like holacracy, and often sort of adopted within the tech world. But I think it's really interesting because I think that we have to adapt our organisations yes. and organise them in ways that are creative, mm. and those are design challenges. Well, they're and... they're they are designed for the for for the for the behavior that you want to see. They're designed with a purpose. So so you you then do the you know the result is you know culture. The result is how people behave. Result is the right. quality of the the you know the products or the services that you deliver. So I mean, I can imagine that you you know you 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 can design a bank, for instance, in a, in a way that is very like a bank, but, but, but I, but, you know, which might not be something I would like to be work in, but the point is more that I don't think we design organizations in that kind of very explicit conscious mm -hmm. way to kind of fit with what we actually try to achieve. I think a lot of, you know, and I know things are, and especially large organizations that are what old, somewhat older and kind of just, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, they grew and they bought other companies and they kind of, you know, it's, it's really a mess usually, to be quite honest. 
I find it quite yeah. of, often that if I'm working for a large organization, I'm amazed that they actually make money, first of all. And how is it possible? Well, because everyone else is doing it the same way. It's such a mess. And people are, mm. in general, people are, are unhappy. So, so, you know, there's so many amazing examples out there. But to, you know, but the sad part is that there are way more examples out there that are not great. And, and so, which is an opportunity, obviously. I was going to say, it's almost like the organization becomes a byproduct of what they're trying to accomplish rather than being intentional about building it, how this guy with the shelves really approached it, you know? And I think can yeah. give a framework. I was just going to say, I have a friend who works at one of the biggest companies in the world, and I won't name names, but they are not doing good. And nobody knows. It's all very hush-hush. But then when she started pulling back the curtains for me, I was like, oh my God, this is a mess. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, like, but exactly like this you know yeah and so david david uh, and me too i mean you know we we take we kind of have some peeks behind the curtains in the kitchen of the company yeah. which is the yeah. part which, yeah which is the best part of the job you go yeah. because you can also leave again by the way <laughs> you're like oh so good luck with that uh, <laughs> no, but 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 looking into the kitchen and going like oh my god how how can you how do you why do you work here how is it possible how, why why nobody feels safe? Everybody's just surviving. And if you also take it back to the building that you grew up in, David, right? It wasn't built like, oh, we just need another building. No, it was built like, okay, we want to bring this group of people together. And okay, well, they can live together. And then we design it in this intentional way. That's really, but also super interesting. Who who was the guy that applied the the 10 principles to the organization? His name's Mark Adams. Yeah, he's still running and taking it to greater heights. And the, everything he does is really infused with those values. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I've, to your point, I've seen that we have taken that peek behind the curtain many times. And Arne and I have seen those close up. And I won't, again, name names, but we worked on some, with some big corporates, big global companies. Sometimes they've asked us to look at the relationship, for instance, between their frontline staff and their ability to deliver great services. But what they're really looking for is a sticking plaster. They want us to come up with something that's quick, a quick fix because they're looking at their next quarter results. And we've sometimes looked behind the scenes and I can think of the particular, I mean, Arne will know the company of which I speak. <laughs> when we did, we did some ethnography and we went and we spoke with some of the teams around the world. And because we were trying to think about how you can unlock the potential of the amazing people that they have at their front line. And then we discovered that in some countries, they weren't actually paying their people. It's like, that sounds like, no, they, of course they were paying their people. No, <laughs> actually, sometimes a whole month would go and the person wouldn't get paid. And so that's a problem, isn't it? When we reported some of the things back, oh, I, you know, they, 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 they didn't really want to hear that. But, I mean, I think that, you know, you get some businesses that take the sticking blast of you. But also, on it, it reminded me also of, so here's, are we allowed a name drop? Are we allowed to do that? Yeah, sure, of course. Tricky yeah. one, I'll, I'll ask. Like are we? Food. Can we do this? Yeah, yeah. They say yes. They say yes. <laughs> okay. okay. So over the years, I, on a, one or two occasions, I've had the real privilege to interview Johnny Ive, and it was really mostly to do with the fact that I was in, some, you know, those jobs. So like running the design council, that sort of thing. So you you it's something that happens he didn't ask so for you by nice. name he didn't ask for you by name <laughs> he said let um, me that guy who he knew me so i was like he was comfortable with me being interviewed so i had these one or two opportunities to interview him and then we'd always prepare and he would tell me some things that i found really interesting and one of them is actually this bit about the relationship of the designer to the organization and he has it's interesting now because he works actually independently of Apple as a consultant. But one of the things that he said was that he's always been quite sort of, he's had a bit of an antipathy, a bit of a sort of concern about working as a large 
producer of products and services with external consultants. And the reason that he would talk about this was that he felt that it's really important to have a responsibility for everything that goes with what you design. So it's very easy to come in from outside and sort of come up with your ideas and then walk away and you leave someone with the problem. Whilst he would talk about the fact that if he were designing an iPhone or, you know, the iMac or whatever it was, if a little bit of the sort of aluminium that he designed separated from the particular bit of plastic rim that he put into the screen after six months or whatever it was, people would always come back to him because he was the designer. So he was responsible and he had to be accountable for what he was doing. And I do think that that's actually a very interesting aspect of design as it's the longevity. And I don't just mean that in terms of products. I mean, in terms of services and brands and the, how we design things is thinking long-termist and think and being responsible for what you do. And I suppose it's one of the reasons why in the work that I do today, I particularly like building long-term relationships and working closely with the organizations and seeing things through and finding smart ways to get things off the ground. I'm a huge believer. And there's, you know, I, I love a design thinking approach to that as well. So I, we've got a little plug here, but we have a book coming out, or I've contributed to a book that's coming out with some friends this Christmas, and it's on experimentation. But it's actually very much how I do believe good businesses operate, which is you don't go big, you start small, and you try things out, and you take a scientific approach to that. So it's not like, you know, you 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 think, okay, well, what are the things that we should test here? There are some things we know, so we don't need to test them, but there's some things we don't know, but we have a hypothesis on. So mm -hmm. let's actually work out how we can run an experiment that will really test these things out well. And I do think that that's actually about responsibility. It's not about then the ego of the designer. It's not the ego of the chief executive or the business. It's actually really taking a responsible view as to how to develop your propositions and your products and your services, developing your ideas based around the needs of users, and then actually working, putting your own creativity into that space, making that leap of imagination which is the exciting bit, of course. And then really bothering to run that experiment, test these things out well, prototype them, reiterate them, and start small and build from there. And when things are having the wrong effect, feel it's okay to stop and move away and change course. So and I just don't think that that happens enough. And usually because people can't be bothered, frankly. Well, well, they can't be bothered. And also, they don't have time. Often, often they are, you know, the, 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 the workloads and the speed of things going to, you know, the go to market kind of process of, of a lot of companies is like, you know, and, and when do you do these things when you, you know, that's a, you know, often a question I, I will get when I you know, train people, for instance, in, in a design thinking kind of a process where we go into, you know, you, you do your research, you know, you you get you built your uh, you know your personas and you and uh, <laughs> and then uh, you know and you then you kind of you 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 change the the the, the brief you can uh, they'll go like yeah you know <laughs> you know the, we're thinking like two years ahead and the uh, the things we're you know designing creating they're all already in the factory and so what if that's wrong <laughs> like huh so I do also feel that there's a moment where we could at least for me I, I started thinking well how can i really help them because in a way what you said you, you said something a bit a few minutes ago or actually an hour ago i guess you said something about uh, yeah, yeah. how what you're most proud of is you know really helping people 
where you go like, ah, oh, you know, that you really helped someone, a person, be it in a training or some coaching or advice or, you know, really helped them, which I, I really resonates with me as well. But because I think, you know, I, th I think th that is where we can make the biggest change. I think that's where the, it's because in a way, the um, changing the big machine is so difficult. But, but I was thinking, mm. you know, nowadays when I run these training, I really infuse them with a little, such a tiny little attitudes, tools, little things they can apply straight away, implement straight away. It, it's not, it doesn't have to be design thinking. It doesn't, it's no, it doesn't really matter, but it's going to help you in the things you're doing. So you keep running do your, keep doing your sprints and be agile or not, or whatever you are, you know, being completely lost and confused in whatever the com company you're in. But hey, here's this little tool and it changes the way you have meetings. Hey, here's this little tool mm -hmm. and it changes the way you can kind of visualize, you know, your stakeholders or, you know, the way you, et cetera, little things. Instead of saying, Here's, you know, and, and I'm sorry because I know the double diamond is your baby, almost, I guess. And so I do, I love the double diamond. I, by the way, I love the double diamond. I don't like the triple diamond. I, mean, I don't know how many diamonds people are still putting on this thing. <laughs> double is simple. It's great. I, I like it because it helps me explain where people are, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't want them to think that they have to go through these steps. I want them to go like, oh, this is a nice tool. You're like, oh, that's really helpful. Oh, well, you know, if I have a meeting and I behave slightly different and I, I, I put some, I, I design some pauses in, in the meetings that nobody's talking and you're just listening to, or, or whatever. That was really helpful. And I feel that that has been so, for me, at least so helpful to really help people where they go like, oh, that really changed everything. Thank you. Instead of saying, ah, yeah, so I, where do I go? Where the first step, the second step? Because it's too much. We can't do it. We're running. And we have 30 minutes meeting back to back all day. You know, so that's in that environment. How do we, you know, how do we change things? And I think by changing one person at a time, right, by giving them one little tool at a time, that's sort of what my, that's where I am at least. <laughs> Seems like a good, I, maybe that's, a conclusion. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's a conclusion, but so my question would be to you, David. So, how, I mean, you know, we've known each other for such, such a long time. And in listening to you, to talk, I mean, you, you know, I love your stories and you're such a great storyteller. And I know we can talk forever. And, and I know there's so many, many more stories. And I love, always love hearing them because they're inspirational. And one of the things that, that also now, and I think maybe Morgan, you can, um, you can kind of, you know, agree with me or not, uh, is that your path, you know, your career, your kind of the things that you've done, when you light up, it's usually about people. It's usually, every time there's amazing people, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's like amazing people everywhere, but helping you. And maybe that's what, what, what Sophia said, where, you know, you pull people into your orbit, but it's also something that you recognize and you kind of, you treasure and you kind of, all, you also lift these people up. Right. That's, you, that's like, what you your, said in the beginning. The ensemble you started with, yeah, the ensemble yeah. is very important to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think if I take away anything from this, it's like I hear amazing people all the time, and so a lesson for me would be, you know, look at look around the people that are around you, and because they're there, they're and you don't have to go look for me. You know, I don't think you have to look for amazing people. I think there are amazing people. But recognize them and and learn from them, and uh, so it's because it's not just about them teaching you; it's also about you learning from them and the willingness to learn from them and and kind of listen to them and and also kind of say you know acknowledge that these are amazing people instead of saying no 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 I I, I need to be you know I'm the the person that it's all about and I no you 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 need to be mentored I mean having a mentor is great but you need to kind of be open to it right so it's like you. Let, let, I, I, let me finish on this little story. So I had the privilege, when I was running DNAD, we would organize, we organized a lecture series. And we'd, we'd, it was a wonderful opportunity to invite amazing people to talk and just tell us about the incredible things that they do. And one of those people was the American graphic designer, Milton Glaser, who, you know, he's the amazing designer who created I Heart New York, you know, actually, mm. yes, it was designed and <laughs> so much besides. 
such a profound man. And he, I remember we went out for dinner. He, but he recounted, and you can read it in his essays as well. He's written about this, that he recounted how what's, he was asked and he thought about what makes a really good designer and what is the sort of, what's the real at the heart of secret sauce. And he said, it's about working with people, the right people. And he said, there is a test. So what you want to do is, whether it's a colleague that you're going to work with in the studio, whether it's a client, he said, what you want to do, we need to recognize that some people will nourish you, which means that when you spend time with them, you will feel good. And some people will be toxic to you. And when you spend time with them, you will feel enervated it, and, and it will bring you down. And we have to almost view that as an experiment. Like, let's go go and spend a bit of time with someone. Like, Arne and I have spent many evenings together. And whenever we spend time together, I feel better. I feel I've enjoyed myself. And that's incredibly important. And we have to do that also with the people that we work with. I, the, I mean, one of the people I'm... I'm spending a bit of time actually on Friday with an ex, I say an ex client, but it was a client at a, he, he's moved to a different company, but he was working for a big rail company. He's ex Virgin Atlantic. And we ran a project together. I just felt inspired every single time that he was in the room. And I loved the way that he treated his team. I loved the way that he was respectful of us and supported us. And because he his attitude to us was so good, we were able to do great work, which also ended up in this book. I'm sorry, it's not the plug of the book, but he-, yeah. he, he, he What's the he name was, of the book? That's the name of the book. Experimentation Field Book, it's called. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And it, but- he's he was just so inspiring to be with and i feel that he was you know similarly i feel that with some of my i look back on you know we've been talking about careers and so forth and i can look back on the time that i ran dnad and there was a moment when it was like a little machine that was humming and it was humming because the people the people in it, in the organization, loved working together. They were, we were all having fun. We were enjoying each other's company. And I feel the same with the team, with the studio, that we, mm. when it's brilliant and when we are at our best, it's when we're all enjoying each other's company and supporting each other and, and it's fun. And that's because you really appreciate each other for you know they this back to the ensemble piece yeah. and you know that whole thing of none of us is you know smarter than all of us so mm. you just have to you have to play to those strengths and and if if you can make that work and enjoy each other's you know the time that you spend together it's mm. so much better and that's really what milton glazer was talking about and it's how he lived his life pushpin studios awesome I, it's it's cool. I think in a way it's round circle from where we started and uh, where where we ended. For me, the the pattern of the communal and the ensemble and people and kind of bringing people together and and you enjoying it because I can tell right. You know, you're kind of you light up when you talk about you know people being together and working together and enjoying each other's company. And it's been an analogy to me of in the you know when we when I was at the design council we ran some really very exciting projects. I, Arne, you, you've heard me talk about them, designing out infection, you know, infe projects on infection control with design out bugs, it was called, in hospitals or working on dementia care or all sorts of really interesting projects, working with ministers and governmental departments. And it was the thing that absolutely I really loved doing was applying design and design thinking and the, tool, the tools and also the skills of real designers in those situations. It was incredibly mm. exciting. But when we started a project, we would always get the, some of the team, the core team that was working on this at all levels, from the most junior people working on it to the most senior, and we'd all have dinner together. 
And for me, it was almost an analogy of what innovation is about, that this whole idea of you bring people together and it's like the best dinner party innovation where people appreciate each other's strengths. They're not that you've got diversity in the room. And if everybody walks out nourished, the likelihood is you'll end up doing some really good things together. We're going to we're going to end on that because I think that's a great advice. And I, I, and I think something to kind of uh, think about how are we creating that in our lives in our in our business and in a, you know so it's really interesting yeah so also i you know start, i start to think like how am i actually doing this now so yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that David. and i know we can talk forever uh, and we did and we will again hopefully we did and i'm wondering how you're going to edit this down because to oh, no anyway worries. that's your challenge not mine yeah exactly <laughs> thank you Thank you very much. No, it's going, be, it's going to be cool. So thank you so much for being on this uh, podcast. No, it's been lovely, Anne, and lovely to meet you, Morgan. Yeah, thank you.